psalm for today is Psalm 80, verses 7 through 15. Restore us, O God of hosts. Let your face shine that we may be saved. You brought a vine out of Egypt, you drove out the nations and planted it. You cleared the ground for it. It took deep root and filled the land. The mountains were covered with its shade, the mighty cedars with its branches. It sent out its branches to the sea, and it shoots to the river. Why then have you broken down its walls, so that all who pass along the way pluck its fruit? The boar from the forest ravages it, and all that move in the field feed on it. Turn again, O God of hosts. Look down from heaven and see. Have regard for this vine, the stock that your right hand planted. The word of the Lord. The lesson is from Philippians chapter 3, verses 4 and 14. Even though I too have reason for confidence in the flesh, if anyone else has reason to be confident in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew, born of Hebrews. As to the law, a Pharisee. As to zeal, a persecutor of the church. As to righteousness under the law, blameless. Yet whatever gains I had, these I have come to regard as loss because of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things, and I regard them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but one that comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in his death. If somehow I may attain the resurrection from the dead, not that I have already obtained this, or have already reached the goal, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but this is one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. The word of the Lord. Please stand for the reading of the gospel.
The one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, and it will crush anyone on whom it falls. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they realized that he was speaking about them. They wanted to arrest him, but they feared the crowds because they regarded him as a prophet. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. You may be seated. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our precious Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Sometimes when I am out and about around town, I'll sometimes bump into a member of this uh, community who grew up in the church, but mostly does not attend worship anymore. And we know each other well enough for a, a visit. And I just saw him last week, and, and when we talk, he usually asks me, well, how are they doing over there at church? How are they doing over there at church? And I always say, well, we're doing fine at our church. Because I feel like after 17 years being with you that I'm part of a we now. I, I hope that's okay. <laughs> so I say, well, we're doing, we're doing fine at our church. And I wish for whatever reason that he come back and be part of the we. Now all throughout our history, Christians have talked about they, and who are they? Well, sometimes the they were the chief priests and the Pharisees. Sometimes the they in, include in the Bible at least a, a list of Samaritans, sinners, lepers, Egyptians. Sometimes the they are women in the Bible. Sometimes the they in the Bible even include children. The biblical list of they is a long one. All through the ages, people have a tendency to distance themselves from the they. You know, it's easier to deplore groups of people rather than individuals. And sometimes we realize in life that we are the they. We get kind of turf conscious with our possessions and our property, and we sometimes presume that our backyard belongs to us. After all, we've mowed it a hundred times, for us to think that we all have our own little patches of earth. The neighbors are they. And we get annoyed if they let their grass grow too long or if their weeds are showing too much in their lawn. And so inspired from Psalm 139, in these last few weeks we are considering the weed and the they. We are considering how God has woven us all together and how God weaves us all together. Now today's lesson from Matthew is about some selfish tenants who were given a plot of land not to own, but simply to tend to take care of, to be stewards of. Jesus is quite clear in this parable that the tenants are not the owners. The tenants were called to be stewards of this land, stewards of the vineyard. And so the owners set up a watchtower, a fence, and a wine press, and they left it for the tenants to farm the land. In the parable, the tenants not only failed to take care of the vineyard, but they also abused the representatives who came to collect the owner's fair share of the harvest. They also abused the owner's son who came to collect. 
left the fair share of the harvest. <coughs> you see, there was this idea in the tenants' minds of the we and of the they. But Jesus makes it very clear in the parable that the tenants were not the landowners, they were the stewards. But their divisions of we and they led them into this delusion of ownership. And I think our problem may be the same. We forget sometimes that we have been called to be merely stewards of the earth. We are called to be tenants. We forget that we are not the owners of the vineyard. You and I are placed here only as the tenants, the privileged share farmers, the honored stewards of God. Not to dominate things, not to own things, but to care for the things that the owner has given to us to care for as stewards. When we forget that we are just tenants and we think that we are owners, then things can go south in a hurry. And that's what happens in the parable. This parable that Jesus tells is full of all of these references to violence. I don't know if you picked up on that as you, as you read it. All of those words of violence, consider the language and the several words that reflect or allude to violence in the parable. The word seized, the word beat, killed, stoned, put to a miserable death, broken to pieces, crushed, rejected. These are all words of violence. You see, when we know our own place within the vineyard, then we are a blessing. But when we forget or we refuse to accept our place, in the vineyard, then we are a curse to the vineyard, and violence results. And violence has many faces and many forms. There is the violence of neglect. There is the violence of abuse, the violence of hunger or poverty, the violence of exploitation, the violence of exclusion, the violence of language. And this violence often stems because we have this delusion of ownership in the world or the delusion of ownership in the vineyard. There seems to be a disconnect between the references to violence and the notion that, at least in this case, that God so loved the vineyard, that God so loved the world, that God sent His Son into the world to redeem it. To save the vineyard, to save the world. And it is this contradiction between the language of violence and the language of love itself that is confusing for us because we too at the same time have both these feelings of love and hate, faith and fear, courage and, and trust and doubt and hope and despair and and joy and sorrow, and, and these emotions are going on in our lives all of the time. You see, it's a fragile vineyard. This is a very fragile vineyard in which we live. It is fragile, but it is also very beautiful, because there is this remarkable owner who comes among us with this amazing love, and, and now this very day, this owner of the vineyard, this very day invites you to come and gather at his table, to receive a meal, to be blessed with a meal of bread and wine. And so we're invited to gather around a table this day, a table that is set because of the presence of our violence in the world. Jesus died as a, as a result of an act of violence, terrible and cruel violence. And in Christ, God identifies with all who suffer 
from the violence of others. Violence in any form that demeans or degrades or dehumanizes or destroys life. In Christ, we are invited to gather around this table. And we remember that it's not a pretty table. It is a table that has been created because of violence. For a body is broken there at the table, and blood has been poured out at the table. But once again, because of the table, you see we are woven together in God's grace. Here at God's table, our violence is quieted at least for a while. Our violence is silenced because of God's grace. And our souls are fed at God's table. At God's table, there is no more a we and a they. At God's table, there's only us, all of us, together, woven in God's grace. So will you come to the table once again? Will you come and be woven together once again at God's table? Let's pray our prayer that we've been praying together. Do you remember it? Lord, we meet together. Lord, weave us together. Let us pray. Lord, we meet together. Lord, weave us together at your table. Amen. And we'll sing together.